I'm so excited. I have back with me today, Paul Wallace, author of The Eden Conspiracy. Now, you've seen Paul a couple of times, both here on my show and on Guy, and of course, other places as well, including his own television network. But today we're going to be talking about his newest book, which is The Eden Conspiracy. And I thought I had read a fair amount about some of the origins of those who call themselves the creators of man and God. But wow, I was in for a surprise. So let's get right to Paul and talk about some of the more juicy nuances in this newest book. Hi, Paul. Good to see you again. G'day, Regina. Thanks for having me on again. Well, um, without getting right to it, I don't want to do a, a spoiler alert right off, but I mean, there were some things in this book that I found very surprising, even though if I'd really thought and put the pieces together, I might have been able to figure it out, but you laid it out for us. So first of all, I want to ask you, the subtitle has in it, The Bible Before God. Now, this is everyone that sees this is very intrigued, Bible Before God. So let's start there and uh, talk a little bit without telling the entire story in a, in a paragraph, what that means. Well, we think of the Bible as being God's book, a book all about God. But in my research path for the Eden series, I've discovered the book is about lots of things. The idea of God is in there, but there's a whole load of ancestral thought and ancestral experience in there as well. And that many of the stories we have told as God's stories through the ages, when you do translation work on the key words, go to the root meanings of those words, another layer of story emerges. And we discover that the source stories were not about God. They were about something else. Many of the God stories in the Bible are actually summary forms of the ancient Sumerian stories of sky people. And so we have paleo contact stories that have become God stories. And so I return to the Bible in the Eden Conspiracy and I ask, what were these stories originally about before they became stories about God? What was it our ancestors originally wanted to tell us? And I find that an encyclopedic, very rich education emerges when you start scratching beneath the surface and go to the original forms of the stories. And you end up with, um, of course, an even more complex cast of characters. And of course, uh, what would a story be without the elimination of the feminine? <laughs> this is, oh, this yes, is that's right. Is what happened to humanity once the feminine was eliminated from, from the Bible itself. So why don't we start with the word Yahweh? And many people have read books and they've read Eric Von Daniken, which you're kind of the new Eric Von Daniken, actually, looking at this word uh, Yahweh and what it actually means. But I found more depth in your book in this than I had seen in my own studies. So let's talk about Yahweh, because he's supposed to be God, and he's supposed to be everywhere, and the book is devoted to Yahweh, the Bible. In the 6th century BCE, that's when the final redaction was done on what became the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, as Christians call it. And the name Yahweh was the name used to refer to their God concept. And the final edit was intended to rework this great library of Hebrew texts and turn it into a seamless story of God. And Yahweh was the name they used for God. But as I show in the Eden Conspiracy, when that name first occurs in the Bible, and when that character shows up, it's clear that that entity was something else, that it was not God, it was a particular character that carried that name. And so Yahweh does a great evolution as a word through the course of the Bible. It begins as a name given to a colonizer. And we have stories of violent colonization that, that run through the Old yeah. Testament. By the time we get to the end of the Hebrew scriptures and we're listening to the minor prophets, they're using the word Yahweh in a completely different way to refer to a transcendent being. So I go back to the beginning and say, well, what was Yahweh in the beginning? Who was that character who took that name? And where did that word come from? Because if you go to Jewish scholars, they puzzle over what this word is, what it means, 
because it doesn't appear to have any etymology, any word history in the Semitic language. It appears as a loan word. And so an example of that would be um, in the post-war period, linguists started discovering words being used um, in Italy and Sicily that they didn't recognize. And one was Siriola, S-I-R-I-O-L-A, and one was uh, Shavelo, S-C-I-A-V-E-L-O. That's how they were written down. And they thought, well, these aren't Italian words. We don't recognize. There's no history to these words. And it took them a while to twig. These were loan words. Sidiola was city hall. Uh, but just put, written in uh -huh. an Italian way. And shavolo was shovel, written in an Italian way. And Yahweh is that kind of a word, a foreign word. It may be from a foreign language, and it's just showed up, and it's now being used by people who don't know what it means. When Moses first hears the word, he has no idea what it means. But I've come to the view, which is shared by many uh, very erudite scholars of uh, the Hebrew tradition, that Yahweh is actually a recollection of sounds, that it's not a word, it's not a name, it's a sequence of sounds. And embedded in the Yahweh name are these two H's, a sound, which is almost silent the way we pronounce Yahweh today. But if you go to Proto-Northwest Semitic, which is the ancestor of uh, the modern Semitic language, was voiced like this. And that's a sound that you can find in narratives all around the world, a k, -k or a k, k You can find it in the name Kukulkan, Quetzalcoatl, Kukumats, Kolkis, Kur, Ikuchu, Kuchedra. These are all around the world, and these are names associated with those cultures' dragon stories. And I show in the Eden Conspiracy that the early Yahweh stories fit perfectly well in the pattern of dragon stories that we find all around the world. And those are memories of contact with other kinds of being, and they are stories of social progress. And the early Yahweh story absolutely fits that pattern. Now, this is where this audience will feel some familiar with the story of the notion of reptilian colonizers. This is a story that's come up quite a bit. And certainly this the work that was done by Zechariah Sitchin initially, and then also by um, Eric von Daniken, in terms of um, the understanding of the Elohim, that's where we first began to see that the Elohim was not a god, but a collective of beings, it's plural. So I think most people are familiar with that. But the notion of Yahweh, Yah Yahweh as being a uh, reptilian figure of extraordinary proportions and, and in fact is depicted as a dragon that breathes fire from its nostrils. This is something that I, I hadn't picked up before. Is this common knowledge um, among your circle? Well, it's common knowledge, but it may be interpreted in various ways because there are plenty of references to Yahweh as a dragon in the text, and so his snout is described, and the destructive fire that can come from his snout, the thickness of his skin, uh, the length of his tail, uh, his flight feathers. Mm -hmm. In the book of Job, Yahweh compares himself with other physical monsters and says he's even tougher than they are, and you'll never get an arrow through his hide. And this is all there for people to read, but what we often do when we come to these texts is, oh, that must be poetry. That must be a metaphor. Right. And if you read the Bible in a bubble, then you can remain with that view. But as soon as you start reading it alongside other ancestral narratives all around the world, you realize this is the same story. This is the same description. A reptilian with feathers, um, a reptilian that manages through fear. Um, that can breathe fire, this is the same story. And when you see them alongside each other, you have to ask, how can different cultures who've had no contact with each other 
come up with the same story that once we were colonized by beings who were very intelligent, very advanced, were reptilian, had feathers. Why would they all invent the same thing randomly? Is it not possible that this is a visual memory that all these cultures have curated? And once you see that, you come back to those texts and realize the writers are telling us straight what was seen and what this entity looked like and how it behaved. One of the reasons that we take it as poetry is because there was a very real effort between the 8th and 6th century BCE by the Jewish kings to obliterate the memory of what Yahweh looked like. So there was a carving of Yahweh in the Jerusalem temple called the Nehushtan, which was destroyed. There were reliefs showing the Tseva Hashemayim, which is the great spectrum of beings and races who co-occupied our planet in the deep past, and the high priest sends the army in to destroy those so that there's no memory of what these beings look like. And that's why we get to modern times and people are unfamiliar with any kind of physical image of Yahweh and have to realize there are verbal descriptions, which we've glossed over because we've read it in a religious kind of way. Okay, so let's get to a little bit of the character characterological part of Yahweh. And I'll just read a passage from your book. This was according to Hosea, right? Uh, it was one of Yahweh's messages to the people. Um, and I think it's important that this is in here to understand what we're dealing with and then look at why this was politically changed into an all-present God. Um, so this says, I will murder you horribly because you've displeased me. No one will be able to protect you from me. I will get you. But if you please me, I will protect you. I suppose for me, right? Also, yes. I smite you and I save you, but only if you worship me. Now, obviously, th th this is these are not the words of any kind of refined or elevated higher dimensional being. And this is throughout the Old Testament. And what I never understood even as a child was how anyone could listen to any of these words and think that that was God speaking. A child knows that. Yet, the Western world has been settled upon this fear and thus an inferiority complex amongst, amongst the humans. So let's talk about how that came to be. Why did the Jewish royalty choose to take this beast on at, at, and represent it as God? And then we'll get to Ashara or Ashera. I mean, certainly when you describe that behavior, anyone who's been in a relationship with an abusive partner will recognize the psychology that's coming in that speech. You know, nobody loves you. Only I love you, but only if you please me. And if you displease me, I will hurt you and nobody can protect you from me because nobody loves you like I do. All that gaslighting is the hallmark of an abusive relationship, but it's also the language of colonization. Every colonizer does that. You know, you're going to find yourself in a war. Do you want me helping you or harming you? I'm here. <laughs> you can't get rid of me. So you choose, right? That's right. And so that's really what that language is. It's not just about the psychology of the being. It's about the experience of being colonized and overpowered. And so the early memories of Yahweh are about that. And it explains why when you get to the book of Jeremiah or Second Kings, the writers tell us that the people remembered Asherah with affection and they had rejected the Yahweh tradition. They didn't obey his laws. They spoke slightingly of him. They disrespected him. And we're told this. Only the narrator then says, isn't that awful? And the reader's expected to agree. But, but why? Why was the memory of one positive and one negative? The stories of Asherah are of uh, being helped in the deep past, of nurture of humanity in the deep past. The stories of Yahweh of colonization. So it makes sense. The popular memory would be that way around. But then what happens is that the royalty decide they're going to choose one God from this great plethora, and this kaleidoscope they have to choose from. Well, politically, how would they gain from that? 
by the time the the what's called the Great Reform began with King Hezekiah in the 8th century BCE, what you had throughout Judea and throughout the Levant was a spectrum of priesthoods and temples and standing stones, all honoring different advanced beings. So there were standing stones scattered throughout the country, marking the place where the people had met an advanced being. And so Jacob does that when he has his experience of beings coming from space, landing, and then going back and up into space via the ladder. So he's got standing stones there at Bethel. Standing stones like that are throughout the country. They become temples. They are staffed by priesthoods. And so you living in your local village, if you want guidance, you'll go to one of their divining rooms. At Harvest Festival, you'll go to the temple to Asherah and thank Asherah for helping the people learn all the secrets of agriculture. If you lived in another place, you might go to the temple of Baal. If you lived in Philistine country, you'd go to the temple of Dagon and thank Dagon for his tuition in the deep past. If you were a Yahwist, in Jerusalem, you would go to the Yahwist temple and give thanks to him for all his assistance. How it played out is that Jerusalem was where the royal court was as well as the Jerusalem temple. And there was a real pivot that happened when a, a boy of eight years old became king. And he presided over a restoration of the temple in Jerusalem. And at some point, the high priest brings to him a little book that he'd discovered, lost apparently in the ruins of the old temple, the book of the laws of Yahweh. And so the, this is now happening when the boy king is about 26. And so he decides he needs to reform the whole nation. What's the point of him worshipping Yahweh while his people are worshipping all these other beings? They should all worship his God. He's the king. And of course, because he came in at eight years old, he's got into a pattern of seeking advice from people helping him reign. And his great helper was Uncle Hilkiah, the high priest of the Jerusalem temple. So by the time Josiah really gets going for 18 years, he's had his uncle Hilkiah come to him and say, Sire, I have identified another threat to your authority over your kingdom. Do you want me to take care of it? Oh, thank you, Hilkiah. Yes, please do. And what that meant each time was that he would shut down another priesthood, demolish another temple, knock down more standing stones, so that they would end up with only the temple in Jerusalem, where he was high priest, so that all the tithes would come to Jerusalem, not to these other temples out there, so that when people wanted guidance, there was no other priesthood to go to, no priests of Baal, no priests of Asherah, all come to the high priestly family in Jerusalem. So there's this great centralization of wealth and power through this reform and turning Judaism into the worship of a single deity. It's unfortunate that that deity was chosen because there were nicer beings they could have commemorated. Well, and by choosing Yahweh, a violent colonizer, it sort of empowers the king to act with force or violence to impose his will, because he's only doing it on behalf of Yahweh. That's what I was going to ask you. There had to be an advantage in choosing the most brutal of all of the gods, certainly the most uh, fearsome of all of the gods, so that he would be able to have the benefit of the obedience of the people as Yahweh demands himself, correct? It, yeah. Exactly. And you become what you worship. Mm -hmm. So if you're worshipping a violent colonizer, you have to justify xenophobia, violence, brutality. And that is the history of what has happened. When that has been our image of God, we have justified the invasion of other people's countries, the enslavement of other people groups, all kinds of misogyny, all kinds of persecutions, thinking we're doing God a favor. And I think it all comes from that distortion of identifying these stories of colonization and this colonizing figure and saying, that's our God.
and also the elimination of the more giving uh, feminine presence that because as you say many artifacts found in ancient judea had to do with hashara having little statues of hashara in the personal home because this is a benevolent being who has come to share knowledge who has helped to create a more not just um just by way of productive but a, a more bountiful society i mean it, that's my understanding of it is that correct and she's the one that is eliminated. Yes, that's absolutely right. So cultures all around the world have these stories that are memories of the Great Leap Forward. How was it our ancestors suddenly uh, were able to cultivate crops and do animal husbandry so that we move from living as foragers, hunter-gatherers, to being able to settle, build towns, we've got surpluses, we can specialize develop cities, develop civilizations. Cultures all around the world have a story that says it wasn't the great wisdom of their ancestral elders. It was non-human helpers who showed up and taught us these things. And Asherah is the Jewish version of that story. And what's so beautiful about that is it shows us we are part of a cosmic family and that beings who are very advanced and very different to us love us and care about us and want to nurture us on planet earth and allow us to have a better human experience if you suddenly airbrush that out of the picture by demolishing the temples and getting rid of the statues and breaking the horns off the altars and forbidding anyone to mention the name of asherah not only have we forgotten that figure but who we think we are has changed we no longer see ourselves as special and valuable and part of a cosmic family. We now only see ourselves as beings here to serve the colonizer, whether the colonizer's orders are helpful to us or not, or whether his orders make sense or not. And you've totally depleted our vision of humanity into something servile and something that's really nothing. And out of that tradition comes the idea that self-abasement and self-negation is good and yeah. that blind obedience is good and yeah. i think we've seen in the in the 20th century where that kind of mentality leads and i think it all goes back to this distortion i agree with you and as i was reading the book it was interesting because i was reflecting back before this move with this political move was made on behalf of king josiah or by King Josiah or the people that were guiding him, I was thinking back about, would have been about 700 years, six, 700 years prior to that, when a similar type of thing happened in Egypt under Akhenaten, when the priesthood was essentially disbanded, you know, one piece at a time, in order to acknowledge a monotheistic view that the only one the one and only god was the sun the central sun now that's a little different the sun gives life to all you can go to the sun you can have direct relationship with the sun and there the idea was you don't need anyone to intercede on your behalf between you and the great sun and central sun that gives life to all nevertheless the political fallout was brutal right? Yes, yes, that's right. Exactly. These stories always have multiple layers. I talk about the monotheizing of Judaism and all that we lost through that process. But there is actually something beautiful about the idea of monotheism, the idea that you shouldn't worship anything that is less than the source of the cosmos. Exactly. And that the was... Of that all was of life. And even exactly. worship isn't the correct word. I know that no, the things that I associate with have always been very clear. Do not worship others no. and put others above yourselves. Every being is learning and doing and doing the best they can in that moment. And it doesn't matter if someone appears to be more glorious, and we'll talk about glory in a moment, than yourself. Give them your love, give them your respect, but never give away your power in worship. I, I think exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. And unfortunately, we have morphed the uh, biblical tradition into a tradition of worship and obedience, which is a total distortion of what uh, 
the truth is total distortion of what Jesus was on about. So you can see the the plus side, for instance, of what Akhenaten is doing. But politically, of course, he's disempowering all these other oh, ancestral groups. <laughs> Everyone died in the end, yeah. And so a lot of fallout, yes. A lot of fallout. I hope you're enjoying this video because if you are, there are dozens more like it on my site, all supported by people like you. So if you'd like to keep this work rolling in and join our community, just click on the Patreon button at reginameredith.com. That also gives you access to insider commentary, my live book club, and other live events with special guests. So join in. Thanks. So now I just mentioned the word glory, which you get into in the book, which was another surprise to me, the notion of what is a glory. You know, when we think we think of glory as simply meaning exalted, yes. if you went to church, Sunday school, and, such, and were raised in the Christian tradition. But you found something quite different. And again, it points back to the visitors and their technology. So let's speak for a moment about glory as you see it in the Bible. So the word glory is a very vague word in uh, the cr Christian tradition and uh, in some circles, glory is just a way of saying, wow, uh, it's the wow of God. But what did it originally mean? When you look at how the word behaves in the text, you realize that the glory is in the sky and now it's on the ground. The glory was here, now it's in the plain. The glory is now moving across the landscape. The glory is now launched. And the more you look at how the glory behaves, you realize it's an object. And one of the most informative things you can do is um, if you can't get to the root meaning of the word, leave it untranslated and then just see what it does. And if you do that with the word kavod, which we translate as glory, you'll realize you're looking at a craft that carries people, that launches and lands. We've got it described by Moses in the book of Exodus, and he talks about it launching and landing vertically, SpaceX style, and being accompanied by a cloud and a fire and shaking the ground when it launches and lands and how you can't be out in the open when it launches. Well, you and I listen to that yeah. and think, I can picture that. I've it's seen that apple. on the TV. Yeah. That does sound like SpaceX or, or yeah. you know, a Saturn V rocket. And there comes a moment when Moses says to the Yahweh character, will you show me your kavod? And that's when the Yahweh character says, you can see it when I launch it, but you can't be out in the open, otherwise it'll kill you. We understand that. I mean, when they launch from Cape Canaveral, the technicians operating that, are several miles away behind reinforced concrete. So we totally get what he's saying in that moment. And if anyone's in any doubt that we're talking about technology, Ezekiel describes what it looks like from the inside. So he describes the metallic textures, the transparent texture of the canopy, the sound of the engine when it's switched on, how the rotors move, the shaking of the craft, as it takes off, the feeling of the G-force as it lifts off and moves away, how the controls respond to voice commands, the omnidirectional wheels, which he describes in such detail that NASA has a patent on them. By the time you've read that, you realize this yeah. is not some ethereal religious vision being invoked by the word Kavod. It's a piece of technology. NASA cannot have a patent on the glory or the spirit of God, which is how it gets translated, kavod and ruach. It has a patent on technology described in such detail that it can be turned into a US patent, which it was in 1974 by Josef Blomrich. So fascinating. You find it in those books, and then you realize that other references to glory are actually references to ancient technology. And I love the fact that Ezekiel, once again, you know, we read it, we think we're in a spiritual text, we try and turn it into metaphor, but in fact, he simply told us what he saw. If you do look at it as a child, it would make perfect sense. Children don't think in terms of metaphor, and yet we, the church, uh, the churches of the planet have seen to it that 
looking at it as a child is not really an option for us. We have to look at it in their interpretation to keep this hidden story hidden. Exactly. I mean, I read Ezekiel when I was 11 years old, Mm -hmm. before I was a Christian believer. And at 11, it was obvious to me, I was reading technology. And then after I became a Christian, it was explained away for me so that I'd see it in spiritual terms. But, you know, there's another bit to the Ezekiel story that comes back to the context that this is the technology of a colonizing force, because after he gets flown around in this craft, uh, he is shown a moment of ethnic cleansing where the deputies of Yahweh are going to eliminate any people who are not grieved by the presence of carvings of other powerful ones. Yahweh wants to get rid of them all. And you read that story and you think, how can you identify families who won't grieve over the presence of carvings in the temple? Well, there are cultures on the planet today where if you don't show open grief at the sickness or passing of the national leader, you're going to be in big trouble. And so there will be public displays of grief, which your viewers may have seen on the TV. That's the kind of regime we're talking about. And so any families identified who are not grieving will be gotten rid of using a Kali Mashatau or a Kali Mapasau. And one is a destroying thing and one is a disintegrating thing. And apparently six individuals equipped with a disintegrating thing can ethnically cleanse an entire district. So again, this is technology and preachers have to do somersaults to turn that into a story of a a loving God and spiritual phenomena, when the writer has just told us at face value there was ethnic cleansing and it was done using advanced technology. Yes. So this brings upon you and your friends in a similar position as yourself uh, an existential crisis, really, for the churches of the world as this information becomes more and more well known. First of all, we have it known in kind of pop media with ancient aliens and such, for example. But now Netflix and some of the other large mainstream uh, streaming companies are going to be delving deeper into these stories themselves. So this becomes very accessible to the public at large, right? And so here you're trying to hold a congregation together with these old stories, and the congregation itself seems to be more the issue because people are so afraid of change and letting go of the familiar. So how how do you and your brethren in your field, um, how are you approaching this now? Well, that's a great question. I was really impressed by what the Roman Catholic Church did in 2009 when Pope Benedict XVI, the most conservative pope in my lifetime, blew me away by calling on the Pontifical Academy of Sciences to discuss the implications of contact with other civilizations, ET civilizations. And when the Pope's spokespeople met the press, they said, not only should we not be surprised that we're in a populated cosmos, but we should be ready to embrace visitors as uh, brothers and sisters, a brother and sister alien. And the reason we shouldn't be surprised, they said, is because it's in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when they said that, that really was an invitation to everybody, not just Roman Catholics, to go back to the Bible and say, what, there are ETs in here, and start finding them. And uh, bravo to them for doing that. But that seemed to be the end of the story. It it all went a bit quiet after that. And it's actually quite difficult to find the articles that were written when those Mm -hmm. spokespeople met the press. I now wonder if they did that because they thought there was going to be a disclosure at that point and they had to get on the front foot. Yeah. But Uh, something, something like that needs to happen in the wider church. My estimation is that in every congregation, you've got a range of views. Because in every congregation, whatever the doctrine, you will have people who've had experiences that don't fit the mainstream narrative, but they'll know they can't talk about them in church because it doesn't fit in the boxes. Some churches gather on the basis of doctrinal bases. So, you know, a list of 12 fundamental truths. And in that part of the church, 
the congregation can almost take on a role where they are policing the doctrine of the pastor. And if the pastor departs from the script, it's him who's in trouble. Uh, and so that is rather intimidating to a pastor who wants to share information that may be there in the Bible, but is off curricula. It's not one of the fundamental truths. How far can he stretch the thinking of his people before the pastoral relationship breaks? And I think every pastor makes that calculation. Anyone who teaches a congregation is wanting to develop the thought life of the people, but how far can you stretch that before they say, you're going to have to leave because you're now preaching heresy? And I think I respect pastors struggling with that, but at some point we're going to reach a, a shift in gravity where enough pastors are across this material that they can back each other up. I have contact with very well-known mega pastors in the United States who know what's in my books and reckon it's correct. They know there's paleo contact in the Bible. They know a lot of the Yahweh stories are not God's stories. And I think we're nearing a point where if they stick their necks out and say, have a look at these text people, see what you think is going on, and give their people permission to see what they're seeing in the texts, to bring the questions they've had for 20 years, then I think they can support each other in moving the conversation forward. We're not quite there yet. Yeah. Pastors are still very isolated who've reached this territory. But I think we're not far from the point, And we're being helped by everything that's in the media at the moment yes. about mm -hmm. um, contact with ET technology and the Pentagon having had a unit investigating UFO crash retrievals for 70 years. The more that's in the press, the easier it is for people in the churches to have conversations. And it's easier for pastors to say, yes, it's right, we should be talking about this because this is all in the Bible. And you don't have to say any more. People can join the dots, but I think we're nearing that point. And yet you say that those articles uh, from the Catholic Church seem to have gone dark a bit. And so then we look back, and I, w I want to bring this up. You wrote about this in your book. In the 1600s, the Presbyterian minister, Robert Kirk, he wrote, and I wrote down, he wrote a book called The Secret Commonwealth. And he was talking about a non, this is in the 1600s, a non-human layer of governance ruling Project Earth. Now, if you get to the military, um, I did an interview with John Warner the Fourth. His father um, was a senator, uh, several term senator, and he was also Secretary of Defense at one point. And so he used to hang out uh, at the Pentagon with his dad, do his homework there, and was allowed to approach anyone and ask anything he wanted. And he recounted a story where he spoke to an elderly admiral and said, what is it? Is it is it true that we have contact with ETs? And he said, basically, son, look around the halls here. They run the show. Now, this is from the military, right? So mm -hmm. that I'm just saying that, meaning the colonizers appear to still be present, still to have a hidden hand. And the fact that this um, breakthrough that happened in the Catholic Church didn't really mushroom and go further, in fact, went kind of dark, would show that the hidden hand is probably still exerting itself uh, within that church. And I would guess, in general, within the governments of the world, the Russians know about it. They say, we can't say anything. We can't do anything. We're not running the show. So how do we take this presence of these colonizers biblically and then confront the modern problem that they haven't left and that we need mm. to break free. Yes, that's right. And that story is in the Bible because there is a moment in 1 Samuel chapter 8 when the people decide they don't want the non-human layer to be governing Project Earth anymore. And they, they tell the Yahweh character, we are not going to live in fear any longer we're not going to serve you. They've realized that if they speak as one voice, they disempower the more powerful entity. And it's almost reached the point where the terror that Yahweh has exerted has, has lost its purchase. And the people are saying, if we confront him, what can he do? 
can only kill us, and the terror has lost its power. Can't kill us all. What would be the point? They know that they can get the situation to pivot. They dismiss Yahweh and choose a human king. But then the story rolls on and says Yahweh may have disappeared from visibility, but he's actually still calling the shots from behind closed doors. And that's how the stories play out. And so our ancestors have given us a story of covert government, a covert non human layer in geopolitics. And it was through reading those stories that I came to the view that the non human layer has never gone away that it is part of our uber government, our covert government. You mentioned Robert Kirk. He came to that conclusion via a different route, and that was through listening to the lived experience and ancestral narratives of the Celtic peoples living in and around Aberfoyle in Scotland in the 1500s and early 1600s. And as he studied the local experience, he came to that same conclusion. There's a non-human layer to the governance of Project Earth. And there is contact at a covert government level. He published a book about that in the early 1600s. Amazing. Now, Presbyterian, Christian, minister, 1600s, that's a very conservative world and a very conservative kind of guy except that's where the data led him, and he had the courage to publish it. It's been in print ever since. So now we come to the present day when somebody like um, Haim Ashed steps forward, Christmas 2020, he, I should say who he is, he was the brigadier general who for 28 years was Israel's chief of space security. Mm -hmm. So it was his job to know if we're in contact if there's any threat. Uh, a very senior position. He also presided over their space programming, the launch of their, their technology into space. Christmas 2020, he steps forward and says, on the basis of his privileged information, 28 years in that job, his understanding is that we have been in contact for a very long time with a number of other spacefaring civilizations but that they have chosen not to self-disclose until we, the general public, have a better understanding of what space is and what spaceships are. And then he went further. He said that it's not just contact, it's collaboration. The USA has collaboration going on. Israel has collaboration going on. Probably other world powers too. They are very interested in planet Earth. They're doing research here, and we have agreements with them for that to happen. Now, this should have been mind-blowing to the whole world. This should have stayed in the news cycle for months and months and months, but it didn't. But if you pay attention to what he's just said, he is only repeating what Robert Kirk said in the 1600s. He's only repeating what our ancestors said thousands of years ago and even wrote into the pages of the Bible, if we read it slowly enough. So the same story has been there for generation after generation. So the picture is the same. Our ancestors didn't just write to tell us what happened to them. They're helping us understand the world as it is and how to live in the world. And I think one of the positive take-homes of what's in the Bible is that we have friends in high places. That it's not a, an all dark, you know, Mars attacks, invasion of the body snatchers kind of picture. That in the Galactic Federation, as Herr Meshed calls it, we have allies. We have some here who love human beings and who've loved us for a very long time and who want to nurture us. And they are on that council. And I have hope for humanity's future because of that help. Uh, the invisible layer. If I look to visible politics, I might come away pretty hopeless. But I do think we have friends in high places who are wanting to progress the human experience in a positive way. And the policy of non-disclosure that we get so frustrated about, you know, can't NASA tell the truth for goodness sake? Why can't the president step forward and tell us what's been going on? I think it's because the policy of non-disclosure has been decided up here. and not down here.
Absolutely. I completely agree with that. And my understanding has been for at least four decades, we humans have never been alone on this planet. There have always been others with us, and they were helping us in the beginning. And it doesn't mean you don't have exploitive colonizers, just as we do on Earth right this very minute. We do this to each other as well. So, exactly. it, and we have to choose the direction. And it was interesting that Ashara was very clear that humanity is a very precious species. And this is something I've been told again and again. We're an absolutely fascinating, multidimensional, unique species that the rest of the cosmos would like to see thrive. It's a very interesting species and it, almost an, ex, an inadvertent experiment, as it were. And so then if you go to the New Testament and you see the words of Jesus, uh, these things I can I can do, you can do, and more, this empower, these kinds of empowering messages throughout, we see that there is, we can, if we're going to hang our coat somewhere, I think we want to hang it on the story that we're a precious species, we're cared for by others, we have free will to be able to make these choices ourselves and that there's wonderful help here for us for anyone if we choose to take the higher path that we are an empowered and growing a species so i agree with you i think it is hopeful in the end but man these guys won't give it up those colonizers won't just wish they just give it up get out of the way go somewhere else we don't want you anymore <laughs> exactly exactly and i think we need to um recover the education that the bible offers which tells us that when we learn to act together we have great power and that when we remember to access our helpers we have great advantage we are capable of so much more than ever we get taught in school and we each have helpers tutors there to nurture our progress through this human experience and i find um the work of Plato inspirational in this area because he really pulled all this together two and a half thousand years ago. And I love the way he expresses himself and then supports the view logically. And he goes even further than saying there are beings who've come from you know other planets and other stars to help us. He identifies beings that that in modern language we would call interdimensional beings mm -hmm. who are very interested in human beings. Yes. And that makes it all the more mystifying. Well, who are we then? Where have we come from? What is so special about us? Plato talks about the material cosmos as being a great experiment of consciousness, that consciousness is experiencing itself through the material cosmos. It becomes intelligent. There's a great question we're all here to answer, which is whether we can coexist in harmony and everything that uh, moves towards a yes in answer to that question, we can call the good. And so Plato has this morality that, that emerges from that. And we're part of that experiment. And so I think that we have an earthling heritage. We have animal strength. We have mammal emotion. We have higher consciousness in a fusion that is similar but different to our cosmic neighbors. And that the way we've worked out, we have a capacity for compassion and imagination and creativity and love that is quite special. Yes. And I think that is why we have attracted a lot of attention from some of our neighbors. And all the ancient stories of hybridization are stories of other races turning up saying, we want more of what the humans have. In our gene that's pool, true. Yes. that's what's going on. We yeah. want some of this colorful experience, this emotionality, this love, this compassion, this spirituality that they have. We often assume that more advanced beings are more advanced in every way. And it's not the case. We have something they don't have. They might have some tech we don't have, but there is something very beautiful about the human experience that has attracted so much attention through the ages. And it's even written in Hermetic and Rosicrucian texts that um, this the notion that the angels will bow before a being who has grown to their capacity and grown to their fullest and has reached a level of enlightenment. And that means many different things. But even that, because of the resistance on earth 
um, just gravity alone, no less emotions and everything else. If we can rise up from within that to find ourselves in a state of peace and non-judgment and, as you say, creativity, love, compassion, they say that is even beyond what the angels have achieved because yes. they have the resistance. That's right. And I think if we go to the stories of human origins, at one level, our ancestors describe it in a very nuts and bolts kind of way, how we were visited, how we were altered, how we were hybridized. But there's another layer to that story as well. So when Plato says that we have interdimensional beings who come to us to assist us in altered states of consciousness, or when we die, Plato says these interdimensional beings might be our ancestors. Well, what does that mean? So who are we really if they are our ancestors? Mm -hmm. And it brings me to traditions like the Cathars, who were, lived in the medieval period, who had developed their ideas from partly from Gnostic Christian sources, and they had come to the view that you and I are interdimensional beings and that there's uh, an interdimensional self that is guiding the material self yes. uh, through this life, that we are our own higher selves, we are our own higher guides, and that we should live with phenomenal courage and a spirit of experiment and exploration as we remember that's what we are, that we are bigger than this material experience. And when Jesus comes along and says, and I'm going to the root meanings here, when he says, go beyond the mind, because the people, powers, and principles of the cosmos are all available to you, he's saying, go beyond your conventional experience and find out what's possible. Yeah. Start playing with the principles of the cosmos because you are more than this 3D experience. Well, Paul, we're going to end on that note because it's absolutely beautiful and it's so well said. So I encourage people to pick up a copy of this book and also for, for family members, for friends who are kind of toiling a little bit with the notion of what is this all about now, especially when it comes to the oppressive forces that people are experiencing through the media, you know, the 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 stories that continue to be passed on, the need for domination and control and taking things from others that don't belong to us. I think um, these deeper stories really matter now. And I love what you've done. I think it's very user-friendly for a person without judgment to go back and be able to look at how we ended up in this position where we became our own jailers, really. Yes, that's right. And to remember that uh, we've always had help and yeah. help is still at hand. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Paul. Again, the book is The Eden Conspiracy. Paul, where can people reach you? What's the best place to reach you? You can find me at paulanthonywallace.com and fifthkind.tv. And I'm in the comments on the Fifth Kind TV and the Paul Wallace channel on YouTube every day. You can contact me there. If you want a longer conversation, then go to paulanthonywallace.com. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. And until next time, uh, go well. And I, I love your work. Thank you so much, Paul. Oh, thanks, Regina. It's been a pleasure. Once again, the name of the book is The Eden Conspiracy. That's Paul's latest book. And he has several others that you might want to read as well. So I would take a look at those. You can find them at major booksellers. And you can also learn more about his work by going to paulanthonywallace.com. Until next time, thank you for joining us here on reginameredith.com. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, and you might also want to consider joining Patreon, which allows me to keep all of this content free and available to everyone. And if you're looking for like-minded souls, you might also enjoy my online community called Our Neighborhood. Links to join are in the description.